Hello everyone and welcome to the Ataxi UK annual conference. My name is Silvia Pradas and I will present the RPLA research update talk and Q&A. I will talk about the collaborative work that Cure the RPLA and Ataxi UK are doing together. Then I will give a brief description of the RPLA and the biology behind the RPLA. And then I will finally get to the most exciting part of the talk, of the talk where I will explain all the projects we are working on. So let's start introducing, introducing our team. Andrea and Paul Compton founded Cure the RPLA and their mission is to connect different groups of people to advance the RPLA research and work towards finding a treatment. Cure the RPLA engaged Ataxi UK at the beginning of this year to help further their efforts. Dr. Julie Greenfield and myself work for Ataxi UK and I coordinate most of the projects that are part of the DRPLA research program. We also have two more members in our team. Dr. Jeff Carroll, he is a Huntington's disease researcher and he is also an advisor to Cure the RPLA. And last but not least, Junko Shiozawa, she is an advisory board member and she has been of great help to reach out to the Japanese community. Dentato rubral pallidolusian atrophy, or the RPLA, is a very is a very rare form of ataxia that affects between 1,000 and 2,000 people worldwide. DRPLA has a higher incidence in the Japanese population where it affects 2 to 7 people per million. And as most of you may know already, DRPLA is inherited in a dominant autosomal manner and is caused by mutations in the atrophin 1 gene. This means that each subsequent generation has a 50% chance of inheriting this disease. DRPLA is caused by CAG repeats expansions in the DNA. If there are less than 35 CAG blocks, there will be no pathology. However, if there are more than 48 CAG blocks, they will cause DRPLA. The number of CAG repeats in the atrophin 1 gene can influence the age of onset for the RPLA. Adult onset DRPLA usually presents with ataxia, chorea, and cognitive and behavioral changes, whereas juvenile onset DRPLA typically presents with seizure, myoclonus, and cognitive decline. These CAG, CAG repeat expansions in the atrophin 1 gene cause protein accumulation in cells. If we look at the normal ATN1 gene with less than 35 CAG blocks, this gene will produce a normal protein and there will be no disease. However, when there is a CAG expansion with more than 48 um, blocks, the ATN1 gene will cause an abnormal protein and these abnormal proteins will accumulate in cells and ultimately cause the RPLA. So the DRPLA research program was started earlier this year and we have been focusing on four different areas of interest. The preclinical projects, the clinical projects, the patient's voice and the outreach activities. And now I will talk about each of these areas in greater detail. So let's start with the preclinical projects. This group all research that takes takes place before clinical trials can begin, and they aim to advance the RPLA knowledge and, for example, help finding and testing potential therapies in, self, in cell models and animal models. Currently, we have five different preclinical projects with researchers in the United States and Europe. As I just mentioned, it is really important to develop tools that will allow researchers to test different treatments. Induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, are skin cells, also called fibroblasts, that can be reprogrammed back into an embryonic-like embryonic state. This means that these cells are now capable of developing into any cell type, like for example, brain cells or neurons. We currently have a project that collected skin cells from 16 DRPLA patients and they have been 
these cells have been reprogrammed into iPS seeds. And they have been also shared with different researchers. This is a great tool because now researchers can differentiate these iPSC cells into neurons and this will help them characterize the effects of the effects of mutated ATN1 proteins. Another tool to help understand the DRPLA mechanisms are the mouse models. Mice are biologically similar to humans and they have been using research for many years to develop treatments. The DRPLA mouse model will mimic DRPLA and researchers will use genetic engineering to insert the human ATN1 gene which will produce human ATN1 protein, allowing researchers to investigate this protein. Dr. Carroll is leading this project and he's working with a biological company to produce this model. Now I'm going to talk about potential therapies that have been developed as part of our preclinical work. Antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs can block the ability of a certain gene to make a protein. You will remember at the start when I talk about the CAG expansions in the atrophin 1 gene, I said that this produce abnormal proteins that accumulate in the cells and ultimately result in the RPLA. ASOs would target the atrophin 1 gene, block atrophin 1 protein production and therefore reverse or at least stop the RPLA progression. ASOs have been approved to treat spinal muscular atrophy and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There is also a clinical trial in phase 3 that is using ASOs in Huntington's disease. We have two groups working on the development of ASOs. One group is at Boston Children's Hospital and they are working on developing an ASO that will be capable of reducing ATN1 levels. They are testing these ASOs in iPSC cells. That's why it's so important that we also develop tools that can be useful for these researchers to test potential treatments. Another group is collaborating with a pharmaceutical company to test different ASOs on, again, iPSC cells. So we just started a new project with a group that will aim to develop small interfering RNA or siRNA. And the principle of siRNA is similar to ASOs. They will also interfere with the expression of the atrophin 1 gene to prevent protein formation. We hope that this siRNA will prevent ATN1 protein aggregation and we will share more about this project soon when we get some preliminary results. Okay, so let's move on and now we will talk about the clinical projects. When we started the DRPLA research program, we spoke with a lot of researchers and pharmaceutical companies and they all agreed that we needed a natural history study. These types of studies follow a group of people with a specific condition over time, in this case, the RPLA. And they aim to collect health information to understand disease progression and to have an insight into how it could be treated. The DRPLA natural history and biomarkers study will help to better understand DRPLA and we have to keep in mind that these studies always come before a clinical trial. As part of this project, researchers will also develop DRPLA biomarkers. These are biological molecules that can be found in blood or other fluids and also in tissues. These biomarkers can be a sign of a normal or an abnormal process and they can also indicate a disease state. For example, one potential biomarker for the RPLA could be the atrophin 1 protein levels that can be found in the cerebrospinal fluid. Biomarkers could be used to see how well the body responds to a treatment in the future. These biomarkers provide an objective measure and they allow to quantify a biological process and they have proved to be quite effective in, the, in other conditions. So this study will have a duration of three years and a study participants will be visited once a year. It will be a multi-center observational study without an experimental treatment. 
we will have a study site in the United Kingdom, in particular in London. There will be a study site in the United States, in New York, North Carolina, and most likely in the West Coast, and also in Japan. We anticipate to enroll 50 participants between the UK and Europe, 50 in Japan, and 10 in the US. For the RBLA patients that cannot travel or do not wish to travel to a study site, there might be the possibility to participate remotely in this study by collecting biosamples. And we will share more about this closer to the study um, starting date, which will be early 2021. So we have been working closely with the clinicians that will participate in this study to develop two protocols, one for pediatric participants and another for adult participants. We hope that having two protocols, protocols will help clinicians capture the difference between juvenile and adult onset DRPLA. Clinicians will collect the following information. They will use questionnaires to collect demographic and clinical history information. They will also assess if the patients have epilepsy, which type and frequency of seizures they have using questionnaires. Clinicians will also perform physical examination and functional tests like the ataxia rating scale, and they will also evaluate a speech and swallowing function. Cognitive function will also be evaluated with different scales and questionnaires, and clinicians will perform brain scanning like MRI. Participants, study participants, will also have the opportunity to um, donate biosamples, and this will be blood, cerebrospinal fluid, buccal swabs, urine, skin biopsy, and feces, and all these biosamples will be used to study um, biomarkers. So now I will talk about all the initiatives we have in place to hear the patient's voice and to hear more about the DRPLA community. You might know this already, but on September 25th, the National Artaxia Foundation and Cure DRPLA hosted the externally led patient focused drug development meeting, which helped inform the FDA and other key stakeholders about the symptoms that matter the most the impact that DRPLA has on patients' daily lives and their priorities in treatments. NAF and Cure DRPLA will produce a Voice of the Patient report that we will share with all of you soon. Cure DRPLA also signed an agreement with a company called Casimir to conduct interviews with DRPLA patients, parents and caregivers. The aim of these interviews is to better understand the DRPLA symptoms and how these can impact the patient and their families. Most of these interviews have been completed and we will share the results with you very soon. And now I am very excited to share this project with you because we have put a lot of effort on this one. In our initial conversations with pharmaceutical companies and other experts in this field, they all advise us that we should have a DRPLA patient registry. A patient registry is a database or a collection of information about people affected by a particular condition. You might wonder why a registry is so important. And that's because the more information we collect about an illness, the closer researchers and pharmaceutical companies can get to help communities find a treatment that works. When a clinical trial is planned, it also, it's also very important that they are able of finding patients that can be contacted quickly to see if they are suitable for that study. The Cure the RPLA Global Patient Registry will collect patient reported information. This means that we will ask patients and caregivers to complete a series of questions. Participation is available to all the RPLA families and patients. And initially, the registry will be available in six different languages, including English. This registry will collect information about the patient demographic and contact details. It will also have questions about the DRPLA diagnostic journey, because as you may know, 
it can take several years before the onset of symptoms and the diagnostic, um, the DRPLA diagnosis. There will be questions about the medical history. For example, we will ask about the first symptom that the patient showed and also which are the most bothersome symptoms as well as the medications and the supplements that the patient has uh, tried. We will ask questions about research. For example, one of them is if you would be willing to be contacted in the future about other research studies. There will be questions about functional mobility. For example, they will ask if the patient uses any assistive device. Questions about activities of daily living will help us understand the impact the RPLA has on, on uh, the patient's lives. And last, we will ask about the DRPLA economic impact. We will ask participants to complete this registry once a year. We understand that completing this registry can be time consuming and not everyone will have plenty of time to complete it. For this reason, only a reduced number of questions will be required to answer, but we encourage everyone to complete as many as possible. Right now, we are working with the database provider that will host our registry, which will be ready in a few months. So stay tuned for the next updates about this project. Okay, and last but not least, I will present all our outreach activities. So in this talk, I have presented a number of projects and I hope you realize how important it is that we engage with the RPLA community. The RPLA is such a rare condition that we need to gather as much information as possible and every patient counts. To pursue our um, aims, we have also reached out to a different um, number of patient groups worldwide. One of them is Eurotaxia. We have also reached out to the Japanese Association of Ataxia Patients to help us transmit our projects to the DRPLA Japanese community. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, Junko has been of great help in here. So before we finish, let me explain what you can do to help us with our mission. Please follow all the updates that we will post on the DRPLA Facebook groups and Rare Connect. And do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or suggestions. I would love to hear from all of you. And last but not least, the most important one, please join or consider joining the Cure the Airplay Global Patient Registry when it goes live. live. And we will announce this on all our platforms so you will not miss it. So this is it. I hope you enjoyed this talk and you are as excited as we are about the DRPLA research program. It is extremely gratifying to develop so many projects for such a rare and devastating condition. In this slide, you can find my email address. And as I said, do not hesitate to contact me with any questions or suggestions. Thank you all for listening. I hope you found this talk useful. And now we will answer some of your questions.